All right, um, we are live. Um, good morning and welcome back to Studio C70 for the May 2023 Philadelphia primary. Today we are here with Jeff Brown, founder of Brown Superstores and candidate for the Democratic nomination for mayor of Philadelphia. Yeah. My name is Louisa Hansen. I am a proud Central High grad, um, 279, and current policy and program fellow at the Committee of 70. Um, thank you so much for being here today, Mr. Brown. So to having. get things started, yeah. How has your personal background inspired you to run for mayor? So uh, I'm a grocer. I'm from a long line of Philadelphia grocers. And we work in the neighborhoods. And you know, we work in a lot of the neighborhoods others don't work in, um, the neighborhoods that suffer a lot. and. Um, it, you know, I try to help people through our grocery business and some philanthropic work we do and, and some government appointments, but, but uh, I, I think we need a bigger change and I think we need a bigger change in government. And so I, I'm inspired to, to be a person that has done like transformational work to solve problems like our work in food deserts, or our work with returning citizens, or our work with black and brown entrepreneurship. And I think that skill of uh, being in chaos and being in a very troubled and broken system and fixing it is a skill that, that could be very useful in our current circumstance. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and how do your personal values and beliefs align with or influence your policy positions? So um, because I grew up in two worlds, I mean, I worked in my dad's store in West Philly, uh, but we lived in the Northeast and I kind of have a mindset that thinks about things from different cultural perspective, different religious perspective. Um, I, I think that um, that is very uh, important to me, like that this, that Philadelphia is a melting pot, melting pot city. People are from all over, from all backgrounds. And uh, I, I so much want to see everyone succeed and have an opportunity to succeed and to build the city that, that helps you succeed. And um, I think that's one of the driving forces. I see, I see that a lot of people are stuck, stuck in structural poverty. And um, I've helped them out in my business. And we hired 60,000 people from the neighborhoods in my career. Um, it's been really, really helpful to sort of learn how to succeed at work. And I've done the same thing at Philadelphia Youth Network where I was chairman for a number of years. We helped like 200,000 young people get their first, second, or third summer internship and teach them about work. And uh, my wife and I started a nonprofit uplift workforce that helps criminally justice involved individuals um, succeed at work. And I'm chairman of the state workforce board, and I do it for the whole state. And so I really think that if you agree that structural poverty is our problem, and I think all our other problems emanate from that. The skills I have are the perfect skills to help us rebuild our systems to give people a hand out of poverty. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna move on to some questions about your approach to governing. Um, so first on that note is, what do you believe is the role of mayor in relations with our communities? So in my mind, the mayor is like um, the leader and manager of the city. It's different than council who's the legislator. So the, the council observes challenges, um, complains about them, comes up with legislative solutions and, um, and adopts a bill or a law. And um, the mayor's job is to then manage the 25 or 26,000 person, mostly unionized workforce to implement all the things we need. Some of them are very routine mundane things, um, like pick up, picking up the trash or, or filling potholes or repairing the lights. And some of them are more strategic, like how do we do better with education or how do we address our crime problem? Uh, but the, the, the mayor is basically, uh, in my mind, our chief leader, our chief manager, um, the person that executes the plans we have. And, th and that's one of the reasons I think my background makes a lot of sense, because that's what I have done for a living all my life. Great, thank you. Um, and you mentioned um, city council. So the next question is, how do you envision working with city council and what is your approach to governing in collaboration with a legislative body? Yeah, I think, I think we need to do better in collaboration. A lot of the things that I envision in my mind I'd like to do, um, I would like to include city council members and some of the labor leaders uh, that organize um, our city's unions to go look at other cities and see how they do different things, learn together 
and, and collaborate before there's an actual bill about how we might correct our city's problems. And, and uh, this way we could learn about any objections or concerns at the early stages. So we could craft our future together and all, all have input into it. And then later include, you know, community groups and citizens. So we, you know, we, we inherently build by and along the way and also take into consideration all the feedback we get and, and concerns. So we have a well thought out, well designed plan. Great. Um, and kind of in in tandem with that, how would you describe your leadership style? I'm collaborative. Um, I'm, I'm used to running a large unionized uh, workplace that's in a co-op. It's almost like a democracy. And so I generally am not the eminent ruler of anything I do. I have to convince other co-op members. I have to convince labor leaders and sometimes my employees. And so I'm used to collaborating. I'm used to like uh, uh, painting a picture of the or a vision of what I want to accomplish and how I want to accomplish it, and I'm accustomed to taking an incredible amount of feedback and listening. So if you if you follow my work in food deserts, it started with town hall meetings and a really good listening process to understand what what the citizens wanted. And part of our success is I was a better listener than many other people because I was able to really understand the heart of what they were asking for. And then I was able to design the system that does it and execute to actually implement uh, what was asked for. And I think when you think about that, that's kind of what you would want in your mayor. Relating to that, uh, one of the most important functions of the mayor is to tap the right people to get the job done. What is the approach you plan to take in hiring members of your staff? So uh, what I found, and, and I've done a lot of hiring, probably more than any candidate that's ever run for mayor, because I've been involved in large businesses, nonprofits, and, and uh, I've had government appointments. And I think when you, when you lead in a more inspirational way with a clear vision of what you want to accomplish, I think that's very attractive to build a good quality team. And so I found when, when I state up front what we're trying to do, it attracts the best talent. And um, when I say the best talent, I don't necessarily mean the best academic achieving person. I mean the right fit for what we need done. And when you look at the key roles, um, we have a lot, a lot to repair in the city, a lot, a lot to reform. And so we're gonna need uh, people that are accustomed to change and helping the whole team get through change and, and are accustomed to dealing with unions, accustomed to dealing with very diverse communities. And so I'm looking for leaders that are diverse and that are, are change managers, change leaders that are accustomed to change in a difficult environment where, where you have to include people, you have to bring them along, you have to address um, their concerns. And um, it's not necessarily the most academically proficient, but it's uh, rugged, rugged, robust leaders um, that, that um, have a love for people, are good listeners, and are good communicators. Absolutely. Um, and now city government can seem out of the control of a lot of Philadelphians. How would you take strides to include more ordinary Philadelphians in the process of making policy? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good question. Um, the, our systems to communicate are not that good right now in Philadelphia. And I think the, the one of the mayor's jobs is to be the one to sell the vision of our future and to take feedback. And so if you, if you look at what I do, besides having town hall meetings, I mean, in this campaign, people probably don't know, but I've had telephonic town hall meetings with 90,000 Philadelphians um, on their landlines. Um, and and that, that's a page out of the book of what I did as a grocer where I regularly would have town hall, town hall meetings in communities. And I think that kind of town hall meeting setup's important. I also think social media is important. I'm an active social media user. People are surprised to learn that I actually read every uh, post and actually respond myself because it's a learning process for me. And sometimes you'll see me having a dialogue um, with Philadelphians about um, their thoughts. And so I think that's a good tool. And um, there are many communication tools today that didn't exist before, and I, I would use them all. It's an all of the above strategy. So you meet people where they are 
I mean, press conferences are a tool and regular communications with the media are a tool. These are all ways, all ways to share your thoughts and take in feedback. And I would plan to use all of them. Great. Um, and why should someone who might be considering sitting out this primary come out and vote for you? So I think um, the city's in trouble. We're in a crisis. I don't think any of us doubt that when you look at the, the uh, violence in the city, um, the drug overdoses, just our regular services like potholes and trash and dumping. Um, we we really we reached a boiling point, I think. And we need to decide who can help us do better and turn the city around. And from my perspective, most of the people running are coming from positions of leadership in our government today, like city council people or the controller. And um, in, in, in the way I look at it, we've been let down by the establishment to get to this point, a crisis point. And I think we need a massive change. And what I represent what I believe is the most significant change because I don't come from government. I, I have worked in government, I've worked in nonprofits and I've worked in business. And all of those experiences, I think, give me a different perspective and will help me to challenge things that other people have accepted to be, well, there's nothing we can do. It's the, it's the only option we have. I found that a lot of the things that existing politicians are accepting shouldn't be accepted. They need to be changed. You need to fight for their change. We're not gonna progress as a city unless we make that change. I also believe that our biggest problem is structural poverty. And if we were to rebuild our systems like K through 12 education and workforce, how we do economic development, if we were to rebuild those systems to help people leave poverty more regularly, and so we had less and less people in poverty all the time, I think you'd find that all our major problems start to get better. Like crime, for example. I mean, I have a crime plan. I've been in, endorsed by everyone in law enforcement because of my management skills. They think I'm the manager to do it. But the truth of the matter is the real long-term solution to crime is help people out of poverty into the middle class. That's how we're gonna have a city we're all proud of. Thank you. Um, now, so we're going to get into a few more questions, more specifically about your policies. Um, so to start off, um, which has been pretty large on everyone's minds, how would you address the crises that are impacting young people in Philadelphia, in particular, unemployment, gun violence, and public education? Yeah, so um, let's start out with um, a gun violence. Um, it, we, it, the current administration, the, the city council has let um, law enforcement, the law enforcement area, especially the police ranks, they've let it dwindle. And so we've lost like 1,500 police officers or about, or about almost 25% of our force. And uh, there's just no visible police presence in the neighborhoods. And um, you, you're going to have a lot of crime if you don't have police. And our efforts have not been good to hire police. Um, and we also have like roughly 1,700 very violent individuals that we've tried to prosecute and have not been successful. And I think there will be a, a rapid reduction in gun, gun violence if we can prosecute these individuals. And I think what we need is better evidence. And you get the better evidence from enhanced forensics. Our forensics is inadequate. And uh, Mayor Kenny did propose a large uh, increase this year. I think that would be helpful. And, and gunshot cameras. We need gunshot cameras because they have the potential to video every gunshot incident if you have the cameras in the right areas and be the evidence we need to prosecute people. I think that's very important. Um, back to the issue of young people, I think it starts at a young age. Like I have, I have four sons. My wife and I kept our sons very busy in their younger years because, you know, busy learning for their future, having fun, learning about arts, le learning about sports, um, doing things to make them, make them ready for the future. And I think the city has disinvested in those things. Like the a lot of libraries don't have librarians or they're not open long hours. Um, the, the, you know, we always hear about the pools not having lifeguards. And I think all these things need to be funded and managed. So young people have a lot of choices of things to do other than hanging out and getting in trouble. That's the first thing. The second thing is when a young person starts to go down the wrong path where they're showing early signs of violence and having difficulty in school, 
we need an early intervention system to work with them to find out what's wrong and to try to address uh, whatever's going on in their lives. And we need to build out a more, more robust system in that. And, and finally, if it's gone too far and, and they've reached a point where they're a danger to society, we gotta pull them out and, and work with them by reducing the risk to society. And you know, in our business, we have hired thousands of returning citizens and you know, people do turn their lives around. We actually have a 98% success in people we've worked with not returning to the criminal justice system. So I haven't given up on people that made mistakes, but we can't let them just freely hurt people. And that, that's kind of what's happening today. Um, and you know, your point about education is a very good point. I'll, I'll jump into that next. I see three major problems in our K through 12 education. One is for students that are college bound, they have a plan to go to college, um, they're going to college for a good reason. The career they want makes sense that they need a college degree. We need more high quality slots. Um, there's the waiting lists are too long for Central, isn't that your alma mater? Yeah, for yeah. Central and Masterman and Girls High, the real high quality college bound slots. Maybe we need two of all those schools to accommodate all the demand. But if it's decades later and you still have thousands of people on the waiting list, we're not being responsive to what our, what our young people need. And in the same token, we diminish career and technical education. And uh, there, there are schools that, that children went to that really did a good job in preparing them for career and technical jobs without a college degree. A lot of them have closed or the programs have been diminished and we have to rebuild our capacity there. And we should modernize it, have the best equipment, a world-class programming, including our teachers, we should collaborate with business. So we're training for an exact job that actually exists in Philadelphia. And when the young people graduate, actually place them in that job and measure our success on the young people's financial success and how well we did in, in helping them out of poverty. Um, that, that would be a huge improvement and what we should focus on. And the, the final thing about education is the buildings. We are wasting an incredible amount of money in the district with really old buildings that have asbestos, they have leaky roofs, they don't have air conditioning. And the most important factor to me is they're half empty. And you know, it costs a lot of money to run a building that's half utilized. And we need to re-rationalize and replan all our buildings. Um, some buildings probably need to be demolished and completely rebuilt because they're just way too old. And you'll see great efficiencies with that in, in operating costs. And the, the capacity of our children to learn in a modern building that was built for the purpose it was intended for. And I think with the Commonwealth case in Pennsylvania, where, where uh, it's found to be illegal, our current funding, uh, education funding system, we have a great opportunity to get more resources from the state. That would be great. We're all counting on that. But I thought, also think we have a great opportunity to get capital funding to be a down payment on the rebuilding of our schools. And that, that's what I would do with that. And, and did I miss a, one of your questions? Part um, of your question or did I get it? Not all? all of them. Yeah, no, sorry, okay. that was a big one. <laughs> right. um, so up next, how would you plan to tackle homelessness and increase the availability of affordable housing in Philadelphia? So um, th there's a, I, I separate the two, although there's some overlapping issues, but um, home, uh, house, let's start out with housing. Um, one, one thing we do, is we, our current real estate taxing system, because of gentrification, some neighbors, their, the value of their house has really increased a lot. And in some years, it could be 100%. Like you could go from 1,000 to 2,000 or from 5,000 to 10,000 in real estate taxes. And I feel that we're forcing people out of their homes. And so I would like to work on having a percentage cap uh, that you can't go uh, beyond uh, to protect people from being uh, thrown out of their homes. And I would also like to have an advocate funded by the city because no, no nonprofit law firm represents uh, homeowners that are low income wh when they're unhappy with their tax assessment. And we should provide that service for low income homeowners or if they're in sheriff sale, they try to protect them to, so they don't lose their home. The second thing is we have a land bank. And the land bank has over 8,500 properties. 
a lot of them in residential neighborhoods. And there's a de design flaw in the land bank because property goes go in, but it can't come out because of councilmatic prerogative, we seem to have a difficult time reutilizing re that property to help people. And I think uh, all of the residential properties should be used for affordable housing wherever possible. It could be direct sale to low income individuals. It could be um, you, you black and brown developers that you contract with to develop uh, affordable housing, um, but we shouldn't leave it idle and we shouldn't leave it blighted. A lot of the city owned properties are some of the most blighted properties in our city. And that's really setting a very poor example. We, we should fix that. And finally, um, we need to invent new creative tools to finance large scale affordable housing projects. And things like floating a bond and financing the projects ourselves actually could mitigate quite a bit of the gap because the city could borrow over a longer period of time at a lower interest rate and passing on that cash flow savings has the potential to make a project work that wouldn't otherwise work if you had the if the developer had to borrow the money on their own. And so that's my thoughts on housing. As far as um, the unhoused population, I, I think a, a disproportionate amount of that is substance abuse related or, or mental health related. And so really that housing is only a small part of it, but the, 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 um, their mental health is a bigger part of it. And um, I, when I worked, when I was on the board, or I am on the board of the convention center, we had a, a, a large number of people living under our tunnels. And we used Philadelphia's homeless outreach uh, folks to, to work with them and to find out how we could get them into supportive housing and treatment. And you know, through discussions, we ultimately convinced them all to do it by discussions, listening, and, and dealing with some of the concerns they had. And I think that's our first line of defense, like try, try to reason with people and get them the help they need. But you know, at the end of the day, if that doesn't work, they can't stay where they are. Like in Kensington, you can't, you can't have drug dealers on every corner. Um, it, it, you know, invisibility to the police where they're seeing what they're doing, selling heroin to our citizens and for them shooting up in front of uh, McPherson Library, that, that's unacceptable. And at the end of the day, they are breaking the law. And, and the fact that they're breaking the law gives us the opportunity um, to bring them in front of the drug court. And the drug court's designed to help people to stay on track with treatment, not to incarcerate people. And so I, I do think they have that disease, not a, and, it, and the crime doesn't come first, and we want to help them. But to help them, it's very hard when you have an addiction to overcome it on your own. And the drug court who will monitor um, their, their urine and blood tests and make sure that they're not on drugs is a very useful tool for compliance and to have a good outcome with treatment. And I think the drug court is the right management system to get people in front of them and, and to give them a choice. And the right choice is to get supportive housing and treatment. And when you're stabilized, to get workforce development training. That's how I would approach it. Thank you. Um, so now our last uh, policy question. What actions will you take to combat climate change and fight for environmental justice in Philadelphia? Thank you. Um, if you look at my history as a grocer, I'm actually very advanced um, in, in that area. And I'll tell you what we've done in our grocery business, and you'll see how that leads to my thoughts on the city. Um, first off, um, to reduce our carbon footprint, a number of our stores have solar. Um, all of our stores, 100% of our lighting's all LED, and we've modernized um, most of our equipment to, to be the, the most efficient uh, from an energy standpoint. Um, the next thing we did uh, involves waste. We've been able to mitigate close to 90% of our waste by, by enhancing recycling programs and by diversion of close-coated food um, to public housing and other uh, food pantries. And so um, a lot of the waste was food waste. Um, things were close coated and, and they would end up getting thrown out. And now we're taking them a day earlier before they, before they expire. And we built a system um, to get it to the people who need it, especially the fresh food. And you know, we actually, um, my wife and I, through the nonprofit we founded, Uplift Solutions, 
um, actually brought Philly Food Rescue. We created it and brought it to Philadelphia. We built it up in capacity. And when it, when it became big, uh, we, we contributed to the Share Food Program. And uh, they're doing that, this now for lots and lots of people all over the city. And I think everything that I just explained is what households and businesses need to be doing to reduce our carbon footprint <laughs> and to have a more sustainable uh, future. I also think that um, the city uh, who's re very reliant on fossil fuel need to have a program to incentivize alternative energy um, that's sustainable. And um, we, we don't really have anything in place today. We should advocate for enhanced incentives at the state and federal level. And we should have our own pro uh, program to help move the city away from fossil fuels. Great, thank you. Um, so that is it for the policy questions. Um, and now to wrap things up, um, this is kind of a large question, but bear with me. Um, what do you hope Philadelphia will look like over the course of the next five or 10 years? And what actions would you take take as mayor to make this a reality? So I think I think we've talked a lot about it. I think po structural poverty is our big problem. Uh, we need to get more than half the people in structural poverty into the middle class. You would see a tremendous benefit from that. We, we would be taking people that need so much help that make it very difficult to manage the finances of the city and make them taxpayers that actually help pay for the system. Um, and, and it would help our crime. But we also need to rebuild our police department that's very diminished. And our whole, our whole criminal justice system needs to be enhanced because um, it, it's really dysfunctional today. And I would hope that we could go from, you know, thousands of gunshot victims per year, uh, you know, over 500 homicides, you know, to a record low number of violence. And I, I do believe that this could be done. And the final two things are the regular things a city needs to do. It's basic work. Sweep the streets, pick up the trash, fill the potholes, prevent, prevent citizens uh, from dumping, um, you know, repair broken lights, all the basic services. We do need a process improvement strategy and a technology strategy to enhance all those things so we do, that, do them efficiently and do it reliably. Because right now we do not have reliable service in our city and we will never be a great city if we have trash everywhere. And so that I hope to be able to bring that to the city, especially with my business background. And I hope to implement my affordable housing strategy we talked about because everybody needs a place to live. And I really do think it's realistic over the next two terms, we can get all of this done. Incredible. Um, thank you so much. Um, so this has been Jeff Brown, um, candidate for the Democratic nomination for mayor. Um, so don't forget for anyone watching, the deadline to register to vote is May 1st and the municipal election will be on May 16th. So be sure to get registered um, and check out our ballot tool at ballot.70.org so you can make your own informed decisions on whom to vote for. Um, and, and thank you again so much, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Th thank you for the great questions.